Hi there, this is the Digital Loop Season 3, Episode 5. If you remember last week, uh, when Ivan and myself were talking about uh, trends for 2015, at some point I mentioned uh, the, the possibility of uh, uh, smartwatches, right? And there's this quote I want to mention, it's called, a watch must deliver the time for at least 24 hours. <laughs> and I really love that. And that's from Dean. Hello, Dean. How are you? Morning. So why uh, did you write this? Oh, well, I've been immersed in CES for a week. The, the circus that is the tech gathering from all the corners of the earth with everyone with a hunger for any form of gadgetry and technical information, that's where kind of everyone was. And that's where all the smartwatches were. Ivan, how are you? Oh, I'm doing well, man. Uh, hi, Dean. Uh, I was just thinking that maybe for those of you that don't know who is Dean, maybe, Dean, if you want to give us a little uh, a brief uh, introduction to, to the, the man, the legend. Uh, I'll be as brief as I can. <laughs> I wear many hats these days. Um, the, the main one is uh, still Senior VP of Creative Innovation at Brownwith Group. Um, you know, we make all sorts of amazing digital experiences and that invariably ends up on numerous devices, pretty much any kind of device and platform you can think about, um, which is why CS is, is always relevant. But a big chunk of that is also working with clients and, and telling them what they should be doing in a year or two years' time. So uh, as interesting as all the consumer stuff is right now, um, it's kind of really is, is, is to get a gauge for what consumers are interested in. Um, but we need, then need to help steer where they should be in those kind of year or two years' time. But then one of my other hats is for people like the BBC, so um, reporting on the stuff. So, I mean, it's great that we get to make it, and then I also get to talk about it. Um, of course, I'm very flattering about our own stuff all the time. Um, but, the, the, you know, the real fun is when you find the gems, um, but actually the best bits are when you find the crap. Um, because And there is a lot of that out there. There is always more bad stuff than there is good. Um, and to be bad doesn't always mean that it is useless because, you know, we've got to go through that kind of elimination process. There's a learning process there. Um, and part of that is to advise clients, advise consumers what not to buy, where clients not to go. Um, but, you know, and then another one of those hats is to kind of travel the world with people like yourselves uh, and, and tell everyone about everything that's kind of going on out there. Yeah, actually, I've seen you. I've seen you speak at several occasions. Is that's actually how we met the first time? I think it was in. Was it in Bournemouth? No, it was not in Bournemouth. It was in. No, it was in Poland, Poland actually, right? First, Poland yeah. for inspiration last year, right? Yeah. Uh, so if you ever have the chance, guys, to to see him speak, he's very entertaining. And uh, you know, one of these numerous clients he's talking about is obviously. I mean, you might not know that, but Brandwith and I know Dina always mentioned the same example, but Brandwith has done apps for uh, Star Wars, which is obviously something that you'd like to put on a business card. I would like that. So but coming back to, to, to the, the crap stuff that you know <laughs> you need to sort out from, this is where basically that was the point of the article you wrote, which was uh, called The Dawn of the Dumb Watches, that you wrote while at CES, because yep. you always carry uh, dozens and dozens of, of wearables and smartwatches and all sorts of gadgets with you. When we were in Athens uh, last year, uh, so you had that uh, latest LG, et cetera, et cetera. So, but what I liked about this article, it was very talking chic, obviously, and that that sentence I quoted about the fact that a, a, a watch must display the time for 24 hours is actually is, is part of this. Is that we are at the very beginning of this road of of smartwatches, even though everybody expects uh, the Apple Watch like Jesus Christ. But uh, we are at the very beginning, and there's a lot of crap. So can you tell us a little bit more about it? I mean, we'll link your article uh, at, at the end of the show, but can you tell us a little bit more about that, about your experience at CES with smartwatches and in more general? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first day thing about CES this year was that it was the same as 2010. It was almost a mirror image. You know, you had, in 2010, you had, I, I think it was 80 tablets um, because everyone knew that Apple, at this point, everyone kind of, knew that Apple was going to launch a tablet in 2010. Um, so they all wanted to get there first. Uh, and in doing so, it was pretty much the same scenario. They were all producing you know, substandard devices just so that they could say they were there first. Um, and what that gave Apple was, you know, they weren't, Apple weren't there. They didn't need to be there because everyone essentially was talking about the, Apple's new tablet without them being there. Um, but what it gave them was 80 
competitors, not against Apple, but against themselves. So they then spent the next spent the next twelve months all destroying each other um, to see who would come out the other end. While Apple could quite happily sit back and just take up the sales. But then this year, it was pretty much the same thing. So everyone everyone was talking about the Apple Watch um, whilst looking at somebody else's watch, um, and yeah, there were smartwatches everywhere. You know, we had. Um, I'm trying to think how, you know, I didn't count them all up, but there was there was a Chinese manufacturer making a copy of the Apple Watch for, that you could buy for twenty seven dollars, um, <laughs> a working version. I mean, even the home screen, you know, the the, the content on screen was you know, nothing like it ever will be for for Apple, but it was a complete knockoff of all the outside. Um, inside, it kind of worked. Um, I, I was really annoyed because I. So yes, it's so vast, and I, I didn't find out the name of this company until the day I was leaving, so I didn't get my hands on one, which I'm really disappointed about, because I'd have been there with a, my suitcase full of knockoff Apple Watches. Um, but, you know, kind of within certain sections, every other stand was a Chinese manufacturer making a smartwatch of some shape or form. Um, but what they all do, and what you kind of find is that they're all... It's, a, it, it's got to be a box-ticking exercise. Apple have spent more than you know, two or three years in, or more in development of this. And what Apple are very good at is not trying to be the first. Um, they just want to be the best or they want to hit the market at the right time with the best developed product that they can have. Again, we're looking at lots of people that have looked at this market for years. And people like LG and Sony have actually been launching the watches for years. I mean, it's really it's funny how the market and the consumer market is catching up and going, oh, smartwatches, that's a new thing. But it's not. I mean, you think decades ago we had calculator watches. I was about to say, we were about <laughs> the same age, and I remember these on my wrist, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and that's why it's funny because a big thing about CES this year was just applying the word smart to things. And the assumption was that they were then smart. And that's why I kind of, you know, I've, as you say, tongue in cheek, called them the dumb watches, because a lot of them were really just digital watches. Um, you know, if you add something that will monitor your heart rate, Okay, that's not really being smart. That's just got a monitor for your heart rate. Um, <laughs> so, you know, what you end up with, and kind of what we found was lots of different watches in particular. I mean, wearables are, is a much, much bigger subject, but watches in particular, they were all trying to specialize in something. But for, a, you know, I'm an I'm a avid watch wearer. Less and less people wear watches these days because they look at the time on their smartphone. But what you'll find is people that like to wear a watch will change that watch because they want to want it to look different rather than they want it to do something else. If I go swimming, I don't want to then change it for my waterproof one. If I'm running, I don't want to change it for the one that will monitor my steps. Um, I want really the one watch or each of my watches to do everything. Um, but I, you know, the, the tough bit for the market at the moment is I want them to do all of those things well. And uh, so the fallout of that lot is kind of the, the Garmin's or Jarmin's, however you however you pronounce them, um, they will do the brilliant location device piece. And then the sports manufacturers, even people like Sony, they will do a really good job of monitoring exactly what your activity is. But really, you still want the fallout of all of these guys back like it was in 2010 with the tablets. You want the fallout to be that the watches that kind of survive from this lot are the ones that are the very best at what they do. Um, so it's a real, you know, it's a minefield out there. If you're going to invest in one now, it's really because you just want one rather than it's going to be the best that it can be. Ivan? I was just going to say that this looks like uh, the welcome to the uh, age of the smart devices and dumb people, right? <laughs> everybody, everybody is, everybody is focusing on having the smart, the smart uh, um, devices. Um, based on your experience at SES, what do you think is it's the, the the right approach? Uh, as you as you mentioned before, I mean, uh, Apple is, is is getting into the dominant position not by being first, but actually by being the best. Um, I have the impression that most of the companies are focused too much on just being competitive and not on right away being dominant. Um, is there any other devices that you think uh, is the same the same approach that 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 Apple is having with the, with the watch? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, another big thing. With, uh, while we're on, I, I guess it's the theme of wearables again. Um, VR, virtual reality headsets, were big at CES. I mean, they were they were nowhere near as big as smartwatches because you know you can't have that many people creating good VR headgear. But you know, I tried on what I'd kind of lined up as to be the best 
competitors there, and and two that really stood out. One was was Oculus and, and Rift, obviously, obviously. And, and you know these guys have they were first. Say they were first. You know they were first in the reboot of VR. We were all around when it was there the first time with dodgy looking fractals yeah. and lawnmower man and all of that kind of concept. <laughs> when it was much more of a concept. Now you know we've been there with Mark One of Rift, which was amazing because you just for being what it was but of course you you know when you take a creative eye to it you can see that there were limitations and um, the latest version the resolution is much improved and there's kind of much more about spatial awareness but the, getting my head inside crescent bay the, the latest one that isn't isn't even available to us as developers yet was just phenomenal um, now the thing about this was that <sighs> See, because it, the, the awareness of, of, of your head positioning and your body positioning is just so good now. But the real noticeable thing is the screen resolution. So it's not just the resolution, but you, you lose the mesh. Um, so even with the latest version that we've, we've got now, you still, although the resolution is high, you're still aware that there is a screen in front of you. But now, essentially, the latest version, you're just there. And that's what's phenomenal because the the demos were just so good. So there's one I I, I don't know what it was. I, I'm I'm not a big gamer. I know of games, but I, I wasn't entirely sure what game I was in. Um, but I was essentially I was moving down a war torn New York street, um, with slow motion battle scenes raging around me. But of course you could you know there's this car exploding in front of me, twisting and turning above my head with bits of shrapnel flying off and all sorts. But the thing was, because it was in such a great slow motion, you could actually duck around the little pieces of shrapnel and feel as if you were really there. I was just phenomenal. So, and and that's me saying that you know I can eulogise about this stuff on and on and on, on. But the key thing now over this next year before Rift is still in consumers' hands is to get as many eyeballs directly on this equipment. Um, because for anyone that's take, looking to take steps into virtual reality, um, you know, the big thing, much like, okay, we'll take a step back again, much like smartwatches, where, as I say, not many people are wearing them now, or nowhere near as many people that used to wear watches, um, there's a whole audience to educate there and say, what, well, why do I need to wear one of these things? I don't kind of get it. I don't, I've still got a smart smartphone that I can look at the time. So virtual reality is that's another whole step removed because there's a much, much, much bigger audience that has no real concept of, of how good it is or how immersive it is. Um, so, yeah, we're going we're gonna to end up with a bunch of us that are not talking to each other, essentially. We're, we're not even going to, even at the moment, we're all sat on a phone and we're texting each other or we're on Snapchat or whatever. At least we're in the same room and we're going to glance across at each other occasionally when we've received a message from that other person. But virtual reality we're just going to lose ourselves completely so what you're telling me is like it's like in that movie with uh, Bruce Willis I think it was called Surrogates with everybody <laughs> basically never leaves his comfort of his home he's in some kind of uh, pod accessing virtual reality at all times and having an avatar in real life that actually goes on to have his, uh, his or her life anyway uh, the, the point what you said is very interesting about educating about how uh, people are not used to me. There was there were Price Waterhouse uh, Coopers did a uh, did a study. I think it was la just at the end of last year. They said that only uh, barely, I think, ten percent of the people would have a, a, a wearable device, and they would uh, have the number here. Uh, seven seven percent wear it a few times a week. Only ten percent wear it uh, every day. Uh, so meaning that there's no. I mean. There was this quote uh, uh, that is relevant. There was this quote that it was somebody, I think it was a CEO of, was it Fitbit? Or I'll remember that at, at, at Le Web. He said that, oh, you know what? Uh, wearables should not be the synonym of droppables, meaning that you, know, you buy one, it's really cool, and then suddenly, uh, well, whatever. After two weeks, you stopped using it. To be honest, that's what happened to me. I mean, I bought a Fitbit. Uh, I bought a second Fitbit because I lost the first one at the airport on the tray, the X-ray, <laughs> at security. <laughs> uh, and then at some point, I just, I just, I just using directly on my smartphone. You can yeah, on 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 the iPhone. You have the uh, the kind of step counting, blah blah blah. So I just transferred everything in that in my phone, and I just stopped wearing. Uh, so this is this, there's this adoption curve that kind of hits a uh, bottleneck for the moment. Maybe because, and that's come back to you, comes back to your point. Maybe because there's still not. A, a, a good reason to have a smartwatch. I mean, you can tell me how many steps I've done during the day. Well, why not? Uh, there's another study. It was uh, 
I was curious. Uh, if you live in the UK, you know Curry's. It's Curry's PC World is. What would be the equivalent in I don't know in the US, Dean? Um, uh, Maplin best Buy or uh, yeah, the, the the Best Buys and I mean all these. I mean it's a big electronic store basically yeah. here in the uh, chain here in the UK. They've done this study and they said. What, what, what would people expect, and we know that Apple doesn't always go into like what people expect, but they wow people with some new stuff, but they were expecting affordability, which is one of, obviously, ease of use, which honestly, <laughs> uh, I've, I've tried a lot of smartwatches, not as many as you, but usually they're really impossible to use, yep. uh, because they considered, oh, let's put a smartphone screen on a, on a, on a watch screen, <laughs> and then you're like, how the hell am I supposed to use that? Uh, uh, functionality, obviously, and, and, and style which comes last, which is interesting, and this is a question I want to ask you. Uh, it seems that Apple is going more, and it will go back to your VR sets, uh, Apple is going more into the uh, a fashion statement. They actually understood that uh, wearing something on your wrist is also a fashion statement. Not everyone is like Dean, ladies and gentlemen, wearing five different uh, appliances on his wrist at the same time and not looking like a dork at all. Most people like me just want a, a nice watch uh, that looks good because, as, as, especially as men, is one of the only pieces of jewelry we can have. So what do you think about this kind of uh, merging and mixing with fashion that Apple is attempting to do? Have you, do you think that they are the switching off of, um, what do you call that, the wristbands and everything is something that will uh, cut on? Yeah, I, th I, th I think it will. And I mean, the, the, this is the first kind of emergence of smart objects. So I mean, you've got three tiers essentially. You've got a tablet that is it doesn't need to look amazing. It, it, I mean, Apple will whatever they produce, it will tack, you know it's tactile. It's it's beautifully produced. It will last a long time. But you're not constantly whipping out your tablet to do something else unless you're just passing it around. The smartphone is different because although it lives in your pocket, you will have it on display more often because you're using it or you're sat on the train or whatever. But then the smartwatch is something that is pretty much always on display. Um, and it's the one thing to watch where you, you know, you kind of where it's a little bit like putting your car keys on the table, but it's it, it it's the same thing is, you know, there has to be a balance there because you, you don't want to be ashamed of the thing that's on your wrist. Um, the real geeks of the world as long as, will think, okay, it's great, as long as it does all the things I want it to do, that'll be fine. But actually, to the majority of us, it's like wearing a, you know, an ill-fitting suit. You don't want that, you want to, don't want to get the wrong impression, but also you just don't want to be embarrassed of it. Um, so, I mean, Apple have taken the right approach in courting fashion. I mean, they've obviously taken, you know, Andrew Lachren's joining last year for retail. You know, this is going to be big within the stores because that's going to be, it's, it's so different a device to everything else that they do. And it's the first one with a real fashion skew. But then you look at the other manufacturers. So of the raft of watches that I've been testing, the probably the, is the most recent actually, is the HP, the ridiculously named HP Michael Bastian Chrono Wing, um, <laughs> which I have on at the moment, but it's you know it's a it's actually the first watch that I've kept wearing, and I'm wearing it now. Um, there were teething problems. Uh, HP will admit this, and they quickly shot another charger out to me in Vegas last week because I complained publicly about the fact that the magnet wasn't strong enough for the charger to actually stick to the back of the watch, so it fell off all the time. You know that's kind of a that's kind of the basics. If you if you've got a watch that may not last with a charge, you actually want to be able to charge it. Um, but it, it's, you know, they work with Michael Bastian, who's a US fashion designer, and that was the skew that they took here. And so they started with a great looking, great feeling watch. Now, <laughs> the problem is they've kind of gone too far the other way. It's a bit of a pain in the ass to use. Legibility is awful. So I kind of glance at it and occasionally work out what the time is at a glance then I'll take a little bit more time and just sort of squint and see what the time is. Now, the thing that you want at a glance, at the very least, is what's the time. Um, now, even down to the fact that to make the thing illuminate, um, you have to press and hold a button for three seconds. Um, what? Three seconds? <laughs> but after two seconds, I've got bored and I've lost interest in what the time was anyway. <laughs> yeah, who has three seconds? <laughs> You just want, you know, that's got to be a single tap, or it's got to illuminate every time a, a, you know, a status comes in. Now, again, there's trade-offs here. So they've gone for the length that the battery will last. So the battery will last a week. You know, that's great. 
until wow. you realise why it will last a week. It's because it never lights up and you can never see anything. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, call me shallow. I've still got it on my wrist because it looks nice. But, again, there's... So, yeah, so there's, there's, there's a mix here. Uh, sorry, Vanna, I'll get to you, but there's a mix here because you remember uh, Johnny Ive said, so the, uh, the designer for Apple said, you know, Switzerland is screwed. I mean, or he used another word, maybe. We're not even sure because he was not fully quoted, obviously. <laughs> uh, I like that quote by John Biggs, who writes at TechCrunch. He said, to, to, to suggest that the iWatch will... was still called the iWatch. There was still no name. To, to suggest that the iWatch will influence Swiss watch, uh, watch buyers is like saying the market for a fine Bordeaux is affected by the advent of a new flavor of vitamin water. Uh, <laughs> I don't like that because if you, if when you ask people when they do about smartwatches, you will, first of all, it's, it's a bit skewed. I mean, I mentioned the, uh, the, 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 the study by Curry's earlier on, and they ask people, uh, in terms of what functionality they were, and uh, coming to your point, uh, there were like uh, people like directions is one of the ones that is really uh, uh, heavily mentioned. Uh, also, some kind of messaging is mentioned as well. I have them here, and uh, and yeah, and uh, the all the uh, all the tracking for fitness. Interesting enough, and I don't know if it's because it didn't ask it or not. Nobody mentions time as something being interesting to have a smartwatch. So <laughs> I'm not even sure we still can still call it a. Still could it watch. But coming to you, the, back to the point of fashion, I think it's that, uh, like you, you said at the end, it's not being, I don't know if it's you being shallow, but some people just wear, it looks good, so you keep wearing it, or, and or it has, it looks dorky and has a lot of, of features, and hopefully that are uh, good, uh, easy to use. So this is a bit where Apple is gunning at, trying to kind of merge these two uh, factors at the same time. What do you think? Uh, there was, maybe you've seen the news, I don't know if you were at CES when it was uh, uh, announced or I think it maybe was leaked. Uh, so next week in Geneva will be the SIHH, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, watch shows in the world after Basel World, which also, also happens in Basel, so in the north of Switzerland. Uh, and Mont Blanc is, uh, has, has released a, a watch which will be, so it will still be a normal watch. But on the opposite side of the wristband, there will be a, a, an additional device, uh, which I haven't seen, I've just seen the pictures, which kind of gives you some additional data. Do you think that's another way to actually kind of mix this? Uh, oh, I, on the one side, I'm luxurious, and on the flip side, I'm dorky. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I guess it is. Um, I mean, the interesting thing is the fallout of this is is how is that market divided up? So we already talked about the, the people that no longer wear a watch because they just look at their phone. Um, I yeah. think they are, they are the people that may be swayed because someone like Apple or you know anyone else that offers something that's actually play you know not playable. I'm not saying gaming or something, but something you just fiddle around with on your wrist. That's that's quite charming. People will kind of see someone else doing it. I mean, Apple have been quite clever with this whole um, person to person send this, you yeah. know, with, you, with your finger, draw a little picture. And I kind of basically joked the other week that most probably the vast majority of pictures in the first month or so will be someone drawing a cock and then sending it to someone else. Um, <laughs> You're you not know, romantic. It, it could be a hard <laughs> crisis. Yeah. It could be, but that's the novelty of that's going to wear off, isn't it? <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, the, the high end, John's right, the high end are not going to, they'll just have one as well. It, they, won't, they won't be swayed into saying, yeah. there's this, you know, Apple are going to make a five grand and upwards gold version. That's just going to be a gold version of an, of, an, of an Apple Watch. You know, if I was in the market, I'd, you know, I say I love watches. Um, and as much as we've talked about it, worked with them, done all sorts of things, I'm actually a bit bored with it now, and I know that after a year of, of owning one, I'd be thinking, I wouldn't be thinking, oh, I'd better buy another one of these. I'd be, I'd be, you know, my eye would be wandering in not the same way as I do with uh, my phone, because I'm kind of bought into the ecosystem of, I have an iPhone, therefore I will just carry on with that. With the watch, I'd be thinking, well, if it's not really adding an enormous amount, I'm quite happy to go with another another watch. Um, Plus, so say, sorry. No, I mean, uh, one, one, one point that I wanted to br bring is the fact that, uh, uh, you know, functionality and the elements that it's not just the watch, but it's actually connected with your phone, which if we have an iPhone, as all of us we do, we know how that, what that means. It means the battery just goes down. I mean, I had, I had a Pebble, uh, I, and I started using it, and yeah, it was very nice to, you know, 
control the music with my phone and my kids my, with my watch, and my kids love that. But um, you know, in order to do that, you need to be connected all the time through Bluetooth. And of course, you know what happens with the phone when you are connected with Bluetooth all day. Uh, you know, I had to be charging the phone all day long every single time. So I stopped wearing it because of that. I mean, I, I, and, and and I think this is these are some of the elements that we need to take into consideration. Yes, the, the, the interface, the design, uh, the, the applications, everything that's very, very cool. But we need to take into consideration the fact that this is an ecosystem and different devices are connected. And if the battery life of these devices sucks as it does now, well, the experience is not that good at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We, you're not going to reach the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I think... Um, you know, we're we're in a we're in that uncomfortable middle ground at the moment with battery life because we we it's it's easy for us obviously and and it's quite warranted for us to criticise the the length of time that a, a, an iPhone mine will never reach the end of the day because I I'm ridiculous yeah but we we're, using we're, it all the time we're not no, normal yeah exactly we are out, outliers I mean if I watch yeah, yeah. most of my friends were like uh, normal people <laughs> or whatever they're pretty and not, not only not only by the way not only yeah not only the iPhone but even Samsung and stuff. I see all of us having troubles at going to the end of the day, and most of the people around me who are not geeks or nerds or whatever you want to call them have no problem reaching the end of the day. So at the end, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's a, it's a it's a it's a good problem to have. Yeah. Uh, all, all, all I have to say is that I tried being normal once. Uh, they were, those were the, the worst three minutes of my life. <laughs> yeah, it's not all it's cracked up to be. <laughs> But I spoke to BMW about because they were they were showing all their the connectivity because another big yeah. thing obviously at, at CES was everything the connected world, um, and they were showing smartwatches as the key to their car and you know essentially doing away with the key completely. And <laughs> while I was talking to the guy from BMW, he said, "Oh, hang on, I'm just going to go and get get my watch. It's on charge." And so I said, well, <laughs> "Hang on a minute. What what happens when I get to my car and I can't get in it or start it because the batteries run out of my watch?" Yeah. He said. Oh well, we have to try these things, you know, and that's why I say, to be fair, you know, it's easy for us to criticise and say, look, um, batteries aren't going to last, but everyone's still got to push on, and we can't wait for the the technology to catch up. We've still got to try and strive for what it should be doing, because by the time you know the 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 battery technology has caught up, then everyone would have tried the right thing, so it will actually line up at the right time. But for now, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want something that will open my the door to my house. Or start my car that relies on the current levels of battery life. But maybe, maybe uh, uh, because I know we, I mean, we can talk for hours, and uh, we still have a few questions. Uh, to come back to what I don't know if you have read what Fred Wilson uh, said on a blog post we mentioned also last week about you know the he, he said he was a bit misunderstood because he said that the Apple Watch won't be as big of a success in terms of sales as the iPhone. Obviously, a lot of people read into that that the Apple Watch would be a failure, and then you know, he went on Twitter and said, no, no, this is not what I said. I said it won't be as big as a success in terms of market. The market would not be as big. Uh, there was uh, another study by, um, I don't have the name here, a Global Web Index, I think, uh, that they've done this, uh, they, the number of, uh, the, the current market size of smartwatch is around, uh, they estimate, uh, the the owner, sorry, is about 150 million peop, uh, smartwatches, people owning smartwatches. Uh, so it's, it's pretty oh, yeah. significant, but still pretty small if you think about the number of people actually owning a, smart, a smartphone. I'm not even talking about a mobile phone, a, a smartphone. So basically, do you reckon, Dean, that uh, with the advent of the Apple Watch, which is rumored to arrive in the next two, three months now, I mean, we see uh, that the uh, I, uh, iOS uh, 8.2.2 is actually ready for the Apple Watch. It should be yeah. coming soon. Do you think, do you reckon that the market is going to be big or not? Um, well, I, I agree exactly with the statement you just said. So I, I think the biggest issue that Apple will face is not consumers. Um, and it's not internally. It's going to be the industry analysts that all sit there and say, "Oh, it's not been a success <laughs> because it hasn't sold. It hasn't shifted X number of units." And it's, yeah, it's, that. it's that's exactly right. It's that comparison with, you know, if everyone's talking about the next big thing, the assumption is the next big thing is bigger than the last big thing yeah. um, in numbers. But it, yeah, it just can't be because people. This isn't going to be a device that people buy without owning the other piece of hardware. Okay. So, you know, if, if it's buying into the Apple e ecosystem, you will already have an iPhone. 
you don't then need an Apple Watch. But if you have an Apple Watch, you really do need an iPhone. So the thing is, you know, the, the user base for smartphones will always be much, much, much bigger than it will be for someone needing, needing a smartwatch. I mean, you, you go back a decade or more, and pe more people would obviously have had um, a need for a watch rather than a smart smartphones wouldn't have been around but you know even more than just a regular phone people still would have said oh, I need a watch um, and, you know they, that would have been the thing that they would have felt as if they'd had their arm chopped off if they'd left the house without mm -hmm. now if you leave the home without your phone you, that's your day is screwed <laughs> no matter how long it takes you to get to your next meeting you'll fight your way back to the house to get your phone so that you know where you are um, so I think that's going to be the biggest problem the, the headline stories will be when Apple's first set of financial results come out after the launch of the Apple watch will be well, look at this it's not taken off in anywhere near the numbers that you people are selling for iPhone or whatever um, so I mean, it's going to be very difficult because it's, and you, and we're the ones that are going to have to be responsible for trying to rake out what's actually sensible in amongst of that in all that lot. But you know, um, it, it is what it is. It's it's just not going to be as big a market um, until we can have something that is built into our arms that entirely replaces the smartphone and it actually takes over and it becomes the one thing we need. We're not quite there yet. No, you don't, honestly, so sorry, but you don't need that because if you have your VR headset at all times, <laughs> I mean, you can just pretend you have something on your arm, I mean, even if it's not there, right? Yeah, you never leave the home ever. Yeah. But are you looking forward to that day? Uh, uh, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, although I, I was reading today a, a very interesting article with uh, Mark Zuckerberg. He said, uh, let me read it up, Zuckerberg's three predictions for what social networks will look like in 10 years. Uh, this is an article in, in VentureBeat.com. And his, his th third major trend, he says that the future of computing is augmented reality, distraction-free, heads-up communication. And basically, this is why probably he invested all these gazillions of dollars on Oculus Rift, uh, because he believes that this is the direction that we're going. And interesting, you know, we're talking about wearables from the point of view of, you know, fashion, from the point of view of, you know, the, the data that they give us. Uh, what do you think about from the point of view of not only data, but also from the experience, you know, f taking into consideration the fact that, you know, there are different sectors where it's clear that the wearable devices is going to be a very important element, like healthcare, uh, uh, like fashion. <laughs> uh, what do you think is actually actually what, what's going to happen from the point of view of this experience? Not just about you know having access to the data, but actually you know people embracing these new habits of you know like like when nobody had a, a smart a smartphone, we didn't have to you know do these things. Now now we, now it's you know normal for everybody. Do you think that people actually are going to slowly get to these new habits of doing everything through their watches or through their Oculus Rift and stuff? I think they, I think they will. I mean, something like Rift is always going to be a, an utterly detached experience. So, you know, the, the, the crossover is something like, I tried the um, Sulon, I can't remember the name of it now. There's, anyway, there's some guys, Canadians again, the Canadians seem to have been taking over CES. They were doing really good stuff. Um, essentially, you know, you've got your Silicon Valley that's creating lots of digital content, you know, that doesn't exist in, in the physical world. But the Canadians were there in force actually making products, um, which was quite refreshing. So, you know, we've already talked about Oculus, Canadian. Um, we've got something like Sulon, um, what well, Cortex? That's the name of it. It's this. It's essentially it's like another Rift headset, but because it's got front cameras, the the content that you're viewing is augmented reality. So you're seeing everything that sits around you. Um, but then in that environment, you're placing overlaid content, exploded engine diagrams that that, that sits in that room that you can go you go through an amazing portal into a gaming environment, but from the room that you're in, all of that stuff again, fascinating. Um, but that kind of gives us three levels. So you've got the fully immersive virtual reality. You've got the augmented reality, which is genuinely overlaid. And then you've got the kind of the glass environment. And again, yet another Canadian company, Recon, um, were there with Jets. Finally, I've been stalking them for about two years, trying to make sure this thing comes to market, and it's finally released next month. Um, they're kind of it, it's using exactly the same technology as glass, but in a headset that doesn't make you look a complete dork. 
Um, so they're essentially, it looks like a pair of Oakley glasses, but slightly more cyborg-like. But they've, they've targeted the sports market. Um, so, you know, it's a market that constantly wants updating, whether it's the heart rate, which is less useful, but actually the speed that you're cycling, the distance yeah. that you've traveled, all of that kind of content, that's all great. And actually, what it does is it's a much more comfortable introduction to that kind of technology, rather than just going, wow, you can have this thing in your eyeball and you can look a bit odd, which was a big step for people to take with glass, yeah. rather than saying, oh, yeah, you know, when you're cycling, you normally wear a pair of sunglasses, or if you're rock climbing or whatever you're doing, that's, there's, no, there's nothing uncomfortable about that at all. I mean, the, the, the point that you're making here is interesting. It means that also uh, the, the, the type of data, that is, the feedback that you get, and that applies both, by the, by the way, to smartwatches and to, the, to kind of augmented reality you get through VR headset, uh, the type of data actually has to matter to you as well. So you, in terms of sports, it's pretty straightforward. You expect that you can, oh, well, I'm going to do a run, and I, know, I, know to, I want to know, you know how, how many, how many um, rounds I've done, et cetera, et cetera, kilometers, how, many, you know, yeah, yeah. how fast I go with my bike, et cetera, et cetera. So this is actually, because the, the problem I see uh, with, uh, especially when we, because when people talk healthcare with variables, they first start with, uh, you know, the number of, the steps you've done during the day, which, okay, it's set at 10,000, but nobody actually knows what 10,000 means. You know, somebody at some point told that 10,000 is supposedly good for you, but nobody actually questions why it's 10,000, maybe because you're different shapes and, and weight, and maybe 5,000 for someone, maybe like 12,000 for someone else, meaning that with, this is also what I think the reason why people drop it is that there's a fun factor at the beginning knowing that you've done maybe, I don't know, 8,000 steps a day, but it kind of wears up very quickly. Whereas in niche markets, and a niche can be very big, by the way, but in niche markets like sports, it's very straightforward. It gives you an actual uh, data you can leverage actually while you're doing the sport or maybe just after to have a feedback system about how you've been doing it. So. I, I think this is one of the way to go in terms of uh, gaining the market is going to people who have actually a need for the product. If you think about GoPro, I mean, we're going away from virtual reality, but GoPro found its market first in ex a lot of extreme sports, people, you know, skydiving and, you know, doing crazy shit and then putting them on YouTube. This is, this is where you gain a market you know, because most of the people, I think, you can have a, the heart rate monitor, you can have like a basically a... Uh, an intensive care unit on your wrist telling you everything about yourself. But if you're not able to understand what this all means, I mean, you'll see a little, you know, some dots like lighting up and stuff, and you're like, oh, wow, yeah, my heart rate is, but I don't know what it means. You know, so I think it's a good way to go through like niche markets where people actually understand what they're doing with it. Don't you think? Uh, I, I just wanted to mention, yeah. you know, because it's connected with what you were saying. Uh, I don't know if you remember at Le Web, Brian Solis uh, introduced the world to uh, Scully. Uh, Scully, this is this helmet company uh, that they developed, yeah. this helmet uh, company that has a uh, camera in the back. So as you are riding, uh, you have a small uh, screen here in the bottom that shows you the view from the back. Uh, it has sensors. They're working on, on, on connectivity between the cast the helmet and, and different cars, so like this, there is a sensors when they're coming. I mean, it looks like, like as you mentioned, a niche, you know, if you are a, a motorcycle uh, a rider, it, you know, having this additional value of having the cameras and the sensors and everything, that's real value. It's not just about, you know, measuring how many kilometers you are riding, but actually it's about probably saving your life, because apart from being a very cool looking helmet, you know, it's, it's a well-developed helmet and actually it's a very functional helmet as well. Dean? Yeah, I mean, personally, I love the idea of the, the full heads up, but I just want it in my eyeballs. I kind of, I don't want all the other stuff. To, we're talking about wearables. I just want, I just want embedded technology. I, I, we need to, need to jump all that. Yeah, I and mean, that's going to be so ridiculously alien to most people. Um, and it's only ever going to be comfortable at this, at this stage if you take it in kind of baby steps. And you know, you know, Evan, as you say, if you're already a motorcyclist, it's no leap of faith whatsoever to put something in the helmet that you're already wearing. Um, you know, if you already wear glasses, if they are equipped to add something without masses of bulk or looking stupid, then that's that's nothing at all. You know, I, I, 
3D TVs in my house. It never had any attraction to yeah, me. Yeah, do you use them? I mean, no, the worst no, no, thing no. possible. Because I don't wear glasses, so when I sit on the sofa watching a film, I don't want to put a pair of glasses on. Um, <laughs> so I just don't, you know, I don't want that experience. It, you know, it's a little bit different if you go to the cinema, or IMAX, or whatever else, because you know you're there for the full experience, and you're basically sat in the dark with a bunch of people. It's fine. Um, but yeah, the, something that adds a barrier or adds a social barrier more than anything else. And again, one of the issues with glass was always, is this person that's wearing these things paying attention to me? Are they recording what I'm yeah. saying to them? You know, there's and that's a you know that's nothing to do, to do with the physical or the digital. That's a social issue that people have, and a hurdle we've got to get over. I just want to mention one example, and then we'll have to wrap up. But uh, in terms of another example of augmenting something that people already use, it's the uh, uh, hearing aids market, you know, people, you know, especially uh, older, the older people will have to wear hearing aids. My father has some, for instance. Mm. They have a, there's a problem with that option because they're never that good. They're sometimes uncomfortable, and you don't really want to to wear them. And I've read this article about new hearing aids that actually you can answer your phones, your phone calls directly in the hearing head, obviously. So that seems pretty logical. But it also it adapts the noise level depending on your location. If you go into a bar, it will actually uh, lower the uh, ambient noise and, and focus on the people in front of you. These are the kind of stuff that are extremely, extremely useful. And I just wanted to mention it because I found it fascinating. And then what's one coming to the point that you just said about embedding, embedding stuff uh, on your uh, on you directly is okay. I know we could have you know this Bluetooth headsets that bankers and and, and real estate people have on all, on all times. But I would I would suggest that stuff like this is actually more useful and could actually also gain uh, traction. But we'll have to wrap up. We'll invite you again because we could go on for like freaking <laughs> hours. Uh, any any other words you want to say? Any other maybe a cool thing you've seen at CES that you want to absolutely mention? Doesn't have to be smartwatch. Doesn't have to be a VR headset. Is there something that struck you? Uh, or any closing words? Yeah, I, mean, I guess I, we talked about all sorts of wearables, you know, and that's a big, big field. Um, the other one thing that was kind of that everyone's going to be talking about this year is robots. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, that was really big for me, um, in as much as it was, it was quite fun because you know, from a professional point of view, we're not going to make robots, so it's just really interesting to see what's going to happen with it. And there's a, you know, there's ways to interact, but. The, the really, really interesting thing was seeing how, you know, robots cover all sorts from drones to whatever kind of shape or form, but the, the more humanoid level was fascinating, and, and seeing how people related to them emotionally, because um, I, I talked to the, the, I can never remember the name of them, it begins with an A, some French guys anyway, uh, they made an amazing Neo robot, um, 10 years in development, almost there for consumers, it's just brilliant. But the new product that they're working on is going to work in the health sector with elderly and rehabilitation, and it becomes a personal companion that essentially will dress them, will get bring food, will do all of these things. But the other thing it will do is actually offer genuine companionship because they will have, on a certain level, some sort of conversation with something that you know they, people will feel as if they can actually relate to. I mean, that thing is, you know, when you're moving something that is physical and digital and you know, a device, a gadget, onto something on a genuine emotional level. I think you know that's this, that's quite worthy. There was this movie. I don't remember. The, I was trying to Google it, but I don't remember. There was this movie about uh, this ex-con uh, guy, heist guy. I think they suddenly has a robot at home to to help him have companionship and help him with these because of course he's elderly, and he starts doing heists again, like. He, Robberies around, you know, around the neighborhood with the help of that robot. I mean, I'll I'd find the name of that that movie and I'll put that in the reference of the show. It's a really <laughs> cool movie to see. Ivan, closing words. Um, no, I mean, very very exciting times. Uh, I I want to thank uh, th th blah 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 blah. It's too early in the morning for me. I wanted to thank uh, Dean for 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 joining us uh, on the Digital Loop. Maybe Dean, you wanna you wanna share uh, where can people um, reach you and find you and see all the incredibly cool things that you and your 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 friends are doing. And just, hold on, and me do not mention the twenty five different Twitter accounts. Just mention one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps won't won't list all all twenty five. Well, I mean, Twitter's the easiest way, and that's active right brain, but it's A C T I V R I G H T brain, um, and Bramwith is um, Bramwithgroup.com. 
Okay, cool. Uh, we'll put all that in the links for, for for those who are listening or watching the show. You'll have all the references and a nice, very uh, nice picture of Dean on the show notes that I'll put later on today. Thank you very much, Dean. We really appreciated your time. It was a, a great show. We'll invite you again because we want to talk gadgets. It's something that we always kind of resist talking because the point is we could talk for hours with it, but having someone like you is really fascinating. So we'll definitely invite you again to talk about some other types of gadgets, maybe drones next time, who knows, because that's another thing we didn't mention. So guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Ivan. Yeah. And see you, everybody, next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Godspeed. -bye. Yeah,